The thought of imprisonment can make the most fearless person quiver, not ACP Benjamin Agojo. Even when he was being tried for abetment to high treason, his fearlessness prevailed. That's because he knew he was innocent. The High Court agreed with him, thus has set him free. But how did a respected police officer get caught up in all this? Does he suspect political machinations? Will he even go back to work as a police officer? Now what does he think of his employer, the Ghana Police Service? And where has this trial taken him the last five years? This is Hot Issues. I'm Kemini Amano, and today on Hot Issues, I sit with the man whose acquittal from a high treason trial seemed to have been welcomed by all well meaning Ghanaians. ACP, you're welcome to Hot Issues. Thank you very much. When the court ruled that you were acquitted, you burst out singing. Why? I had been expecting it, and. Um... I just had to give the glory to God. And that's why I waited until it was all over and I came down and started singing with my friends and my family and my friends, mm. giving glory to God and thanking Jehovah uh, because he alone and had done it. It had been five long years of going to court and going to, into detention. What was the most challenging period or point within that period? The most challenging periods were the two occasions that I was detained, first for three months, but the second one mostly for two weeks. You did, we didn't have access to our families, um, we had the BNI. and i um, The first instance too, for the first week, I wasn't having access to my family and it would take you, your family, a whole day to meet you. They were frustrated. Your family cannot meet you today, meet you tomorrow. Sometimes they can only see you in a week. But thankfully, I was there for just five days. And I didn't like the treatment they were giving. So my lawyer applied to the court. And the court ordered that I should be detained at the, in police custody. Mm. So I was sent to a ministry's police station um, where my family could visit mm. me daily. Mm. And that was more humane for me. I see. What went through your head during that period of detention as you sat quietly those two weeks, as you sat quietly between November and January? What did you think about those nights? Um, within those periods, let, let me start with the first day. When I was sent to the BNI custody the first night, let me say that I slept like a baby. I had a good conscience. I knew I hadn't done anything untoward. I was only wondering why these people were doing what they were doing to me. And so I didn't have any issues. My conscience was very clear, and mm. so I slept very well. But I saw it as an opportunity also, because right from there, I started putting my thoughts together. Mm. I knew I was going to go through a system which I had known to be a bit funny, mm -hmm. but uh, Going through it personally, I thought I should begin to put my thoughts on paper, and that's what I did. I want to understand when you say that you knew a system yeah. that was a bit funny. What do you mean by that? I knew you could, when you are arrested at a BNI, for instance, your family will not have access to you. Mm -hmm. You didn't have any idea about time because nobody cares about whether you only know that it is day and it is night. Those were the only thing that you, you, you knew. And that's the difference between the police. Nobody will have, you don't have access to phone. You cannot make, make phone mm. calls to. But at the police station, at least, you have to reach your family. And if you need your family for something urgent, the police are obliged to help you to do that. And police do that very often in all charge offices. But in BNI, you will not be allowed to do that kind of thing. And that, those were some of the most challenging times that I had at the BNI. But at the, in the police custody, if you needed some help, the police are ready to help you because their, their, their mandate is quite different right. from that of the, 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 I mean, service to the people. What are some of the thoughts you put on paper? Wow. 
I have a whole book that will be launching very soon, and I must, I must be frank with you, and I'm working on it, I'm finalizing it, it's been edited mm. at various places already. I've talked about my deal at the BNI, I've, talk, I've talked about some of the inhumane treatment over there, mm. I've talked about the fact that they do not allow lawyers mm. there, and some of the things that some of my colleagues told, them, told me about them, because Remember, they, 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 in, during the second arrest, they put all of us together in one, in one um, uh, 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 custody. And therefore, we're able to interact and share ideas as to what happened to each of us, which I've put on paper. And, uh, tell, me, tell me a little bit about that. I, I, I want to, for instance, say that in some cases, in some cases, some of, some of them were beaten. Were you beaten? Anybody could touch me. Why do you think they couldn't because, touch Because they knew I know them very well, and therefore they could not do that to me. But they did it to others. And for instance, <laughs> the, the, the two people's uh, 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 what's called secret codes on their phones mm. and accessed and enforced them, which should have been done at the court, with a court order. Mm -hmm. But they, 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 they tortured some of them, and that's their own testimony, and they gave it even in open court. And, and then took it and, and had access to their phones. And in some cases, deleted whatever they wanted to delete. But mine, nobody could force me to have access to my, uh. my code. And those were some of the things that I'm talking about. Do, do you think your ranking and the police may have played a role in that? I wouldn't, I wouldn't, I wouldn't say that. Uh. But um, maybe they know why they couldn't do that. Let's go back to when you were released from the NIB yeah. to police custody. Yeah. At the time, you were a police officer Thanks. of great repute yeah. who was facing this um, serious situation. Um, you were put in cells, just yeah. like the people you had handcuffed in the past. Yeah. When you looked at that, you look back at that period, yeah. what feelings does that bring to you? Well, it, 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 uh, it, it wasn't anything strange to me because I had always known that policemen had been arrested before. Um, as an officer, it's possible you could even detain an, another officer for misconduct, for certain behaviors that you think were untoward. So it wasn't anything strange to me. But maybe my rank and other things. Um, but I, it, it wasn't a problem for me because when I was sent to custody, especially... Um, uh, uh, ministries, police station, mm -hmm. they were a bit concerned because apparently I was senior to all, the, all, all of them there. Some of them were even my students. But you see, I told them, look, I'm here in a different capacity and I didn't give them any cause to worry at all. I made sure I didn't cross <laughs> the counter. Mm -hmm. And there was no day I even crossed the counter. There were times officers came and said, oh, come, come and stand. I said, no. This is where I'm supposed to be. I'm not supposed to cross the counter. So I never, for all the period that I was at that place, I never crossed the counter. Just to ensure that their work was smooth and I didn't want to give them any problem. When you asked yourself, why are these people doing that? What answers did you give yourself as to why somebody will be doing that or some people may be doing this to you? Are you talking about my arrest? The entire situation. You know, um, I, I, I made this statement somewhere yesterday, and I'm repeating it here. You see, when, when as an investigator, because I've been a police, out of my 36 years career, I've been an investigator for well over 12 years. As an investigator, when you are doing your investigation, sometimes we, not most of the times, you reconstruct the scene. Mm -hmm. um, in other words, you go back to find out how did it all start. Mm -hmm. And when I reconstructed this whole thing, I could tell you, and I'm surprised that certain people do not realize that this whole thing started from the IDEG presentation that I did uh, in 2018, where I critiqued not sitting government, mm. but a system in place where the police, uh, police council is dominated by the party in power and the government in power. And for that matter, we could not have a, a, an independent police operating. Because definitely, they are in your hands and you could move them. You could move the IGP anywhere, anytime. 
and, and, and the commissioners could be moved anyhow. He could, the, the president at any point in time could instruct where a particular commissioner should be because it is part of the constitution. And therefore, and therefore, I critique that system. I think from that point, looking at the people at the forum at, or at the workshop, and the fact that defense intelligence and other people, the CID, the police couples, and other people were there, once you begin to talk about this kind of things in a tough way, and especially in uniform, mm -hmm. in uniform as an assistant commissioner, you are in their you are on national security radar, and they'll be watching you. And even after my presentation, a lot of friends, even from their own side, call me to say, look, be careful. They are looking out for you. You're, the least thing you do, they'll mm. take you on. And so I wasn't surprised. I see. And earlier on, I had said that a very senior member of government had threatened me on a platform that I shared with him mm. for expressing my opinion on, on, on what constitutes Arab, uh, uh, what, uh, civil uprising. Mm -hmm. We were all discussing. After a while, he came back to say he's off the line or he's off the mark. He must be brought to order. So all these things played on my mind and I knew where it was coming from. I see. I want us to stick with the start of this whole thing. Yeah. Now, you say that it started from IDEG. Yeah. Prosecution also thinks that it's your association with TAG yeah. that began all of those things. So let's talk about that. It's you right. and TAG, yeah. how did the relationship begin? Um, if you wouldn't mind, I would want to make a, a, a comment about a particular incident mm -hmm. when I was at BNI mm. so that it would set certain records straight. Absolutely. If you recall, I went to court on the 6th of January, or 6th of November, 2019, in uniform. And it raised a lot of eyebrows. Mm. And people, because I was in custody, I came back to read how people condemned me as an officer. Why should you? You should have known better. Take note. I was invited to BNI in uniform, mm -hmm. fully dressed. Mm -hmm. The BNI de decided to detain me whilst in uniform. In other words, they asked me to put my clothes uniform aside and detain me. They didn't have the wisdom, and I I'm, I'm, I'm want to be emphatic, they didn't have the wisdom and the professional ethics to ask to take me to my house, to search me or to do anything. Mm. Mark those words, I've been accused of high abetting a crime, a high treason, and I was never searched. Nothing of that was done. I was just placed in custody. Mm. They didn't give me opportunity to go and take any of my clothes. I stayed in custody from Monday, Tuesday, and on Wednesday, they said, we are going to court. What were they expecting me to dress in? The only clothes available was my uniform. Mm. So I wore my uniform in the full glare of the BNI offices. They took me into their vehicle and sent me to court. Could anybody blame me for going to court in uniform? Or were they, excuse my language, expect me to go to court in my panties? This was some of the prof unprofessional approach of the uh, BNI, which people didn't understand, and yet sought to attack a poor person who, who, had been, who was so vulnerable and had been detained. If you, had, if you arrest somebody, go and search the person Make sure that he has the appropriate clothes and then put the mm. uniform there. And then at the end of the day, you can now say, wear, you can wear this uniform, wear the whatever. And if I had another uniform, there was no way I was going to wear that. In any case, if I had decided that, look, I wasn't going to wear that uniform, could you have imagined what would happen? They would say, Agojo refuses to go to court. Mm. So I wore my uniform and I went to court. And yet they came back blaming me for wearing that including the prosecution team, the attorney general's team, and other things. People just express their ignorance on some of these things. Mm -hmm. And sometimes I feel very bad about it. I see. But I thank you for the opportunity to explain to the world that this was what happened. It was the unprofessional practice of the BNI at mm -hmm. the time, now called NIB, that caused me to wear that. I see. In any case, they knew I was wearing it. And that was the only uniform or clothes available to me. Right. I couldn't have gone 
the without groups. without a anything. Now, so, 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 yes. Yeah, so, so, so let's talk about uh, the you know what prosecution says is the genesis of all this. Yeah. Your relationship or association with the uh, civil society group Take Action Ghana. Um, how did you get in touch with them? How did you begin this relationship? I'm not surprised. Definitely the prosecution couldn't have told you um, the whole, the genesis was IDEG, of course. But I agree that they have to take it from uh, TAG. I've already narrated the story that TAG, uh, uh, Dr. McPalm contacted me in November when I was traveling to Haiti on UN mission. I was then in Uganda, Entebbe, and I was doing a program there before. So I received a, a call, a WhatsApp call from an unknown number. And then the person introduced himself as Dr. Makpa, um, who owned an NGO, a medical officer who also owned an NGO. And the NGO, he was trying to explain to me what the NGO did or was doing at the time. So I said, okay, fine, if you have an NGO, send me the profile of the NGO. And because he wanted me to join them so that I could uh, be part of it. So I said, send me the profile of the NGO. And when he sent me the profile of the NGO, amongst others, it was stated, and it is still stated, that it is democracy-oriented mm. NGO, helping to mobilize people, civil society and other people to work towards development of the country and in advocacy, in education, and other things. Based on that, I agree. This profile was read in court on, my, on my Wednesday as part of the reasons why I was acquitted and discharged. Mm. So based on that, I joined TAG. And I also joined a few other platforms, sub-platforms. Mm. On, on, uh, on, I mean, on all the platforms that I joined, there was nothing discussed about coup d'etat mm. or forceful removal of the government mm. in power. Whatever we discussed was democratic issues, uh, battling uh, political vigilantes and uh, election violence and all kinds of things. Those were the things and how to ensure that um, um, our democracy works. Those were the things we discussed. And that is why till today, they have not been able to link me with any statement that I made or was suggested to have been made by Dr. McPalm against me. Or I see, but pr prosecution also made uh, use of the word Arab Springs a lot. That's interesting. Uh, how do you fit in that? Or how did they try to fit you in that? Okay. The prosecution made use the term, let me, let me explain something. The prosecution used the term Al Arab Spring to say that it originated from me, and mm -hmm. it's true. Okay. In, in one of our discussions with um, Dr. McPalm, he sought my views on Arab Spring. What is it? And do you think that it could happen in Ghana? I express my opinion on what it is and the fact that it could happen in Ghana and that some of the, some of the signs are already present in Ghana. It was an opinion. In any case, remember, how many times have we not heard people in Ghana talked about Arab Spring? Were we not in Ghana here when a certain presidential candidate of a very important major party in this country used that term in a, red, a very uh, I mean, uh, famous radio station, was he arrested? When one archbishop used it, he even described it as Arab revolution, and he said it was going to, it's going to sweep through the whole of West Africa. Was he arrested? When Yame, Dr. Nyahota Makulu mentioned um, Arab and a uh, civil uprising imminent in Ghana, was he arrest, arrested? And many others who have cautioned that, look, this is the issue. In any case, what is Arab Spring? When Egyptians hmm, sat at Tahil Square for almost three weeks or 21 days, and the government and the president resigned, was he a forceful remover? Listen, people should understand what Arab Spring is. Mm. It is a democratic means of expressing dissent. Just like demon demonstration can turn violent, I mean, common demonstration can 
Kumi Prekum, did you not turn violent? Did we call it forceful removal? No, we didn't. So the fact that people on a spontaneous uh, 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 demonstration, in some cases, turn violent, does not make it um, a, a, a force, uh, I mean, a coup d'etat. Mm. You cannot equate Arab Spring to a coup d'etat. And let me just land. And therefore, even if you want to, look at Tahir Square. Tahir Square was a situation where people sat there. They just went a, a sit-down kind of thing. Mm. And, and they sat there for weeks and said, you must, you must do something about this situation. Was it also a forceful one? So people must understand. And if they don't understand, I insist that they must learn. You can't equate Arab Spring to a coup d'etat. We're it is a misunderstanding of the term. And if they don't understand, they should learn. We're going to talk a bit more about that. Uh, but let's take a break. When we come back, ACP Agojo is here with us. Welcome back to Hot Issues. My uh, guest today is ACP Dr. Benjamin Agojo. Doc, um, you know, you, you, you say that if they don't understand, they should understand. Was it an issue of not understanding with prosecution, or it was just a malicious attempt to persecute you? In my opinion, it was both. First, they didn't understand. They equated Arab Spring to a coup d'etat, and they pushed that agenda strongly, because if they really understood, then they would have known that it wasn't going to stick, it wasn't going to work. And be because they didn't understand, and remember, when I was even acquitted, a minister came out to say, well, if they had done their work very well, they could have ensured that I, would, I, I wouldn't have been acquitted. Because, uh, I mean, how could a, a senior officer be talking about Arab Spring on a platform? He had forgotten how his presidential candidate then talked about the same Arab Spring and was never arrested. You see, so it was, it was really a persecution and a misunderstanding. That's why I insist that they should learn. Mm. And it was also a persecution because, if you may allow me, look at a situation where they are claiming that the coup plot was alleged on a particular platform. And by the time they came to court, they didn't know that I was not on that platform. They assumed that I was on that platform. Now, assuming they were correct that I was on that platform, there were other people on that platform, there were professors on that platform, there were medical officers on that platform, there were lawyers on that platform, some of whom contributed money, sometimes in dollars, towards a, a, a medical outreach program initiated by Dr. McPalm. Why didn't they arrest those ones? Why did they single me out? When I was not even on that platform, they singled me out. Mm and charged me for court. But they left all those people out. For your, for your thoughts and for your contribution to TAG? Well, for whatever reason, Mon because... Mon I, monetary wise also. Well, I'm saying that others also contributed. And they were even on the platform where it was alleged they planned the coup. Mm -hmm. I wasn't even on that platform. So, so again... So it was persecution. I, right. And I do want to, you know, clarify on the six yeah. of those who were standing in trial. Yes. Were found guilty. Yes. Of high treason. Yeah. You, on the other hand, yeah. were, were, were found not guilty of abetment to this high treason. What I want to understand is, is there a relationship between the four of you who were found not guilty of abetment three, to this, three, three of you, yeah. who were found not guilty of abetment to uh, this crime, and the, and the six who were found guilty? Let me say that I didn't know any of the other people who were acquitted. Never heard of them? I never heard of them. Sedu, I never knew him until we were all placed in the same custody or maybe we met in court. Kenneth Gameli, I never knew him. I had never known the name or met him ever. The others uh, accused persons who were sentenced, I had never met them in any way. The only person I had met mm. in my life was Dr. McPalm, where I gave him Six in like 2000, mm -hmm. and it was in connection with that medical outreach program. The BNI wasn't there, the NIB wasn't there, and yet they assumed that the money was meant for 
something else instead of what I had told them it was meant for. So again, help me understand. At what point did you know that, uh, well, would you say that the common denominator between the, those who were acquitted yeah. and those who were found guilty is, is uh, take action Ghana? I wouldn't say Is that, that what you glean from I, the I wouldn't trial? say that. There were some of them who were not on take action Ghana. Do you think that perhaps um, this group yeah. may have presented themselves falsely to you based on the outcome of this uh, trial? I wouldn't say so because, you see, we had a general platform, Take Action Ghana. Uh, uh, take Action Ghana. Then, according to the prosecution, which I also found to be true in, 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 in their disclosures, there was another platform which existed before I even came, and I wasn't ever put on that platform. That's where the alleged certain things were discussed, uh, certain things were planned towards removing the government. I wasn't part of it. Then, whilst I came on the platform, there were other platforms, uh, other, other was a platform that we opened to facilitate the discussions. And on all those dis uh, platforms, we actually discuss democracy-oriented issues mm. of moving TAG forward to make it a credible uh, NGO. Now, if somebody uh, had issues with those on the TAG executive platform, it was completely up to them to deal with them. I wasn't part of it. You wouldn't know. And I wouldn't know. Mm. And I don't want to talk about it. Fair point. You have publicly accused the defense minister of being behind the arrest and prosecution. What was informing, uh, you know, that conclusion? Interesting. I never mentioned the name, but once you have mentioned the name, uh, the, 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 the designation. designation, that's interesting. I am currently on the same platform with the defense minister. Mm. The name of the platform is Alert with Adam Bona. Mm. Now, on that platform, we have the defense minister, the interior minister, we have politicians, we have, we have spokespersons of this current government, we have police officers, we have military officers, retired and active, and we have all kinds of people. The media people, most of the media people are even on that platform. So there was a comment, or somebody posted something about a caption, a caption that um, a civil uprising is imminent, Dr. Nyahuta Mekulu. And then it generated discussion, and we all shared our views. Some agreed, some didn't agree. I realized there was, even at that point, a misunderstanding of the term. And so I made my point forcefully to say that, look, some of these elements are there. We better take steps to avert them rather than denying them. Now, this were some of the comments. I'm just paraphrasing what I said. Now, these comments went and nobody talked about it. Then, months after, or weeks after, when the issue of this alleged coup protest were arrested, there was discussion about this. And some people were saying, oh, it couldn't have been cool. Others would say kitchen knife cool and others. So we were all uh, chatting and I also chat. I, I was also part of it. Then all of a sudden, the defense minister reposted that comment I had told you about mm. and then added, he's way off the mark. He must be brought to order. I'm just quoting him. He's way off the mark and must be brought to order. I protested why anybody should threaten me on this platform. I reported the issue to Adam Bona, who is the creator, who created the platform mm. and whose name is on the platform. Adam Bona contacted him mm. and came back to me to say that, well, he has spoken to him that, look, this is an open platform and so, so, and so, and therefore you should allow people to express their views. These are all on record and we could go back to it and he himself, and I mean, anybody on that platform could access what I'm talking about. And so I was threatened by the minister. And if I, just barely two weeks after the threat, I was arrested, where would I look? I could only look at the, I can only attribute it to the defense minister. And don't also forget that the institution which inv started the investigation on this alleged coup was an institution under the supervision of the de defense minister. So that's your suspicion? I mean... <laughs> or much more than suspicion? Much more than suspicion. 
Because he had threatened me that he was bringing me to, an, to order. Mm. What else could he do than to ask them to investigate me? And somehow, when they got to know that my name was, I was part of the TAG platform, they said, no, we must get him. What's your relationship with TAG now? Well, I'm still on TAG platform. Um, you see, it's not been proscribed. Nobody has banned that. And so I'm still there. And I'm there on purpose. Because if I had removed myself from the platform, I wasn't, it was, it would be like, okay, so you were, you, you knew what was coming, so you removed yourself from it. I didn't. I'm still there. Many people have left. In some cases, I'm even the only person left on the platform. I'm telling you, a number of platforms. So in some cases, I'm the only person left. Mm. But I still, I'm still there. I'm still there because of reasons such as what we are talking about today. And I'm still, I was there because I knew if I had removed myself, I couldn't have had access to the information on the platform to defend myself. If I had removed myself, how could I go, get mm. all the information that I needed to disprove the allegations against me? If this was an attempt to gag you, target you, do you think it would have achieved its purpose by now? Has it achieved the purpose Very good. to, to gag you? Well, I mean, I mean you, you, you could answer this question better. Looking at what I'm talking about here, has it gagged me? My, by my nature, I've always spoken my mind, even in the police service. And I've, I must admit that I've had fair problems in the police service because I sp I've always spoken my mind. Mm -hmm. And if you wouldn't mind, I can preempt that and, and just tell you one or two occasions where I've had problems for speaking my mind and to challenge even certain authorities. One occasion was in Bolga in 2007, where a powerful woman, in quotes, decided to use the police facility, the back of the police cells. I was the commander there. I was the superintendent of police. He used the back of the uh, uh, police uh, station. Virtually, he, the, his, his clients passed behind the cells to access his hotel. When there was a thoroughfare, I closed it. The woman came to me and said, my son, I mean, I said, no, please, we can't, we can't, we can't sacrifice the interests of the police for your interests. Mm -hmm. So use the thoroughfare or the route to your place, or whatever, the route to your place. The woman went and reported me to the regional commander. The regional commander called me. I went there. He agreed with me after my explanation. We came back to supervise the place, I mean, to inspect the place, and he was happy that I took that step. Three yeah. days after he entered my office with the woman and said, open the place for the woman. I said, no, I can't do that. I mean, you can't sacrifice the interest of the police for the woman. Mm. And so match me to the IGP. Do you know that this matter ended in my dismissal in 2007 I see. from the police service? I appealed against it. Eventually, when they upheld my appeal, they reduced me from superintendent to, to DSP. I and see. I had to climb again to assistant commissioner. Which is where, again, you had your Which problem. is where, again, I'm I, having another problem. I want to talk about, you know, the police service, you and this trial. Yeah. You were also undergoing concurrently uh, disciplinary, uh, you know, proceedings within the service. You, you, were, you were interdicted. I was interdicted, but I, I never went through any disciplinary procedures. Right. The only thing was that I was interdicted. But I had a whole problem with that, that interdiction. Yeah, I, I want to talk about that interdiction. Yeah. Um, that interdiction should have been uh, lifted by now if uh, disciplinary proceedings were not brought against you. Definitely. Well, why do you think that was, was not done? Well, multiplicity of factors, and I don't want to go into them because I even took action against the police service mm. in court. The court decided not to, in their discretion, they thought that they couldn't give me that order. And therefore, I appeal to this, uh, 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 the Court of Appeal. And I tell you, I don't want to talk about the frustration. I went through and I abandoned it. Because from- In court? I'm telling you, from the High Court to the, uh, to the Court of Appeal, I had too many frustrations, which I have documented in my book. And I wouldn't talk about them here. At the appropriate time, it will be, it will be out. These frustrations you thought were coming from the, the court? Top? The court. I wouldn't say the top, I say from the court. Because if I appeal against, an, I mean, a, a ruling or a judgment from a high court, 
I, I wonder why it should be taking over one year and it will not even get to the high court. Do you... I, I, oh, to the court of appeal. Mm. I mean, and, and, and yet, I, I don't want to delve into those ones here, if you may excuse me on that, because these Fair are court point. issues and I don't want to talk Fair about point. it. Do you think that the police service dealt with you fairly, respectfully, and rightly over this period? Over this period, um, I don't think police was fair to me, but I don't blame them. I don't blame them for the same reasons that I espoused at IDEG. This is somebody who has been accused of high treason. Any IGP who will lift that interdiction will be gone, will be sacked. And therefore, they were also looking behind their shoulders just to be sure that they kept their position. The law says that if after three months you cannot institute or you are unable to institute any disciplinary action against an officer who is interdicted, you must leave the interdiction and you must start work. And the law also states that where the case in point is in court, the IGP should wait for the outcome of the case before taking any action against the police officer. So here we are, the CI is saying that, look, the case that was brought against me was not by the police. It was by the state. They took me straight to court. And I can tell you that, well, I, I mean, I want to leave some of those controversial issues. No, but, go ahead, no, no, no. Okay. But, but at the end of the day, you took me to court. Mm -hmm. And when you took me to court, I even appeared before court the first time, then later you interdicted me. If after three months you could not institute it, then you just have to let me go. If you had problems with my, the fact that uh, you don't want me to wear uniform and work, there are other places that you could place me to work in the interest of the police service. I could even teach at the police college or the police academy or somewhere where I'll not be in the public view, if that's what you want. The police did not have the guts the courage to do what they were expected to do. But I don't blame them. Because if we had an independent police, they would have done the needful. And therefore, I wouldn't blame the police for that ordeal. Mm. We'll talk a bit more about the independence of the police, but let's stick with the um, interdiction. And now that you have been acquitted, um, have you got in touch since your acquittal? Not yet. I mean, it's too early. Um, it happened on Wednesday. Mm -hmm. I must relax a bit. I must speak my mind on the issue. Remember, it's been four years where my, my name has been dragged in the mud. And that's one of the reasons why I have to give such interviews, because then I had not been able to explain the, my side of the story. And maybe when I was even giving evidence, it, it was not giving that publicity. So this is an opportunity for me to explain my side of the story. And maybe from next week, my lawyers and will we'll begin to think of what to do. Mm. Um, so, so 36 years for the police service. 36 years, that's the only career I've known in my whole life. And look at how they bastardized my career. <coughs> Taking me through this raw deal, at the end of the day, acquitted and discharged. But I always thank God that even before this time, the issue about unbailable offenses had been removed mm. by way of a Supreme Court judgment. Otherwise, do you know what it implies? It would have implied that I'll be in custody from the 6th of November, November 2019 until last Wednesday. And the disadvantage, and I want to make this appeal to those who care about this, because it has happened to me. It, you don't know whom it's going to happen to. I never thought for a day that I was going to spend one day in police cells, but I did. And it was, it was my time and I had to go through it, somebody else may go through it, so we must give a serious thought to that. Do you know that, and I believe, that if I were put in custody for the whole four years, I couldn't have defended myself the way I had done. One, I wasn't going to have access to my phone because the BNI would have seized my phone. It would have been with them all this while. My lawyers were not going to have access to that phone. And therefore, I wasn't going to be able to comfortably and competently have information extracted from my phone to defend myself. Mm. This is a caution I'm giving to other people because it's happened to me and it may happen to another person.
And we must be very careful about this phone and the BNI just seizing people's phone and extracting information without court orders. And when they do, they, they, they can even delete others. When they can even finish, get the information, then delete your whole information, which they did to one of the accused persons. Mm. I don't want to mention names. Where would your career have been if this trial did not happen the last five years? Um... Irrespective of whoever will be the IGP, I think that I could be a deputy commissioner of police or a commissioner of police because I've known situations where people have taken one year, one and a half years or two years mm. to move from one thing to another, especially from assistant commissioner. So I could be a DCOP mm. at West or a commissioner of police. One of the things that hacks rendering things that we have seen on television throughout your trial was your wife yeah. and you know the impact it, we could see had you know had, had been written all over her physically tell me how is she doing how did she receive this she's doing very well um thank god for her life and uh, I, I i i think that she has had her own ordeals in through this period but she's not new to it she knows the man she's married, and I've narrated to you some of the ordeals I've gone exactly. through in the past. Mm -hmm. She had been with me all this while in my police career. Well, what was the first thing that she, you, know, you said to each other after the acquittal, uh, the ruling? We just hugged, and I thanked her for her support, and that was it. She knew what I meant. I see. When we come back, a bit more on this issue. Don't go away. Welcome back to Hot Issues. My discussion today is a really crucial one with ACP uh, Dr. Benjamin Agoju. What would you say the regrets are when you look back at the last few uh, years? Is there anything you think you could have done differently? Do I have any regrets, particularly with the police service? No, it is the police service that has brought me this far. The only job I've known, and remember I enlisted in the police service as a constable when I had finished sixth form and went through the ranks, did my first degree whilst I was in the police service, did my main field when I was in the police service on scholarship outside Ghana, and did my PhD when I was still in the police service outside Ghana. And the interesting thing maybe is this. It was at the time that I was interdicted first in respect of the Bulga issue mm -hmm. that I got a scholarship to go and do a PhD outside. So I was, I was in Italy when I was recalled. Mm. And when I came back, I just had to ap 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 appeal to the police service to give me steady leave to complete. Mm. So I don't really have any regrets. Um, the but but is there anything I, over the last five years or maybe even six that you think you could have done differently? No, no. I, I, I wouldn't say differently, but maybe if I had any regrets, it's mm. this particular five years particularly what they have taken me through, is something that I don't think I'm too pleased with. Not because I've done something untoward, just for working and just for speaking my mind in a mm. country, in a democracy, in a so-called democracy. Somebody shares an opinion, and as a result of that opinion, he's criminalized and then, and then put through this kind of trial for five years, where you go to court on Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, you report to BNI. Mm. So effectively, four days out of the five, day, five working days is taken out from you. You could not do any work. Mm. You have family. You have been interdicted. A lot of your salary is cut off. And therefore, you've been disadvantaged in many ways. And yet, you have to drive to court every day and back. You have to report to BNI. Mm -hmm. All these things are financial, had financial implications, which were really telling. Um, and I can also tell you that it had impact on my family, psychologically and emotionally and physically and everything. You have a family and all of a sudden, everything was going well and of, all of a sudden, everything is upside down. I see. How will that, I mean, how would you manage that? How upside down do things get? I mean, financially, you are handicapped, okay? and all your allowances 
out there are no longer there. Um, friends have decided to abandon you. You know, once you have been tagged with this cool and other things, people do not even want to call your phone because they believe that once you are called, um, their, their phones, the BNI could have access to their numbers and begin to trade them or question them. So I lost a, my, some of my best friends mm. who have not spoken to me mm. for the past five years and do not even have the courage to congratulate me now. What would you say to those? Oh, those people, I just say, I thank them for their lives and I thank them for the role they've played in my life. I think they are in my past. But I don't hold anything against anybody. I, I just thank God for my life. Sometimes you have to delete certain people from your life. So somehow, they may have deleted me, I've also deleted them, and life goes on. I see. But, you know, you talk about speaking your mind a lot. Do you think that as a police officer, uh, perhaps you spoke your mind a little too much? In what respect? Because what, whatever I said, for instance, the IDA presentation, I didn't just go there on my own. The IGP was given an invitation. And then they suggested that since I had been working with them, especially on political vigilantes, um, they would prefer that I come. IGP approved it and allowed me to go. I see. Do, do you appreciate that point? And then on a platform where you share ideas, would anybody be criminalized for just talking about sharing his opinion on Arab Spring, which is a topical issue? People have even stood in their, in, in their, in their pulpit and then told the whole world how Arab Spring, Arab Revolution is going to sweep across West Africa. Somebody had told us, said, King Ani King, Arab Spring, Beba, Ghana. There's and no he's, still, he's, still, he's, still, he's still going around, and nobody has thought of uh, 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 taking him on. And I express opinion, and I am a criminal. There's no denying that you know, this trial has had a, you know, an adverse impact on your life, and by extension, your family. Now you, your, your lawyer has hinted of seeking compensation uh, through the courts. Um, let's talk about that uh, compensation you're looking for. I, I would prefer not to talk about the compensation. That's an issue that is on the table. Mm -hmm. I may have further discussions with my lawyers, and then we may come up with whatever we want to. And that issue is actually not for public discussion. We just have to go to the court. My lawyer only mentioned it, and there is nothing wrong with mentioning it, just mm -hmm. to let people know that we're like, this is what we may do. You deserve compensation, don't you? Definitely. You can't treat me. I mean, do you know what my family has gone through? Do you know how traumatized they are? Do you know how some of my members of my family have suffered because they are associated with me? There are things I wouldn't like to say on this platform. But I can tell you that family members have suffered because they are associated with me. Some of them have to be moved from one place to another on their jobs because of me. And, and, and I don't want to personalize issues because they are still doing their work. Mm. And, and by espousing, talking too much about these issues may not be too good for their, in their own, may not be in their interest. So a lot of trauma had gone on. The only difference had been that I'd always stood firm and assured them that, look, I had done nothing untold. I don't know how and when it was going to end, but I knew that it would end in our favor. Mm. And that was why I granted that interview the first day when I was acquitted. And I said, look, I knew that was how it was going to end. But I didn't know when it was going to end. And I was just thanking Jehovah for it. I see. It's been a very difficult five, almost five years of an officer who had traveled around the globe, being on his own, independent, travel around. I said it elsewhere, and I'm repeating that if... We have to go in for about two or three officers in the Ghana police office who, or maybe, I may be among one, the first, the first five group of police officers who have traveled most in, around the world. Yeah. Teaching here, working here. All of a sudden, I, I returned from Liberia not two weeks before I was arrested, just to go and teach. And all of a sudden, your car career collapses, and your world grace. collapses, and you are being disgraced People, you have, a tag has been placed on you. Nobody wants to talk to you. You lose your friends. I mean, it, it doesn't matter how much you've saved. 
Five years without doing anything, the money will be off. Can you imagine what we have gone through? So, right, so when so, we talk about compensation, mm -hmm. it is in order. The state will have to compensate us, I mean, either willingly or we will go to court. I mean, you, you tell us that your finances took a hit. Um, how have you survived the last five years? By the grace of God. By the grace of God. And by the support of very reliable friends who believed in me. It didn't matter. Look, some of those friends never asked me, Ben, what happened? They just knew I couldn't have done it, and that was it. They never asked me, how did it happen? What happened? They've never asked me. They don't even have the details of what happened, but they just believe that, no. The man we know couldn't have gotten involved, himself involved in any coup d'etat. And thankfully, God has vindicated me. As we have noted, your reputation took a, a, a hit during this trial. Your finances took a hit during this trial. Your career had been uh, almost washed down the drain yeah, during yeah, this. Yeah. You would need to recover from all of that. Yeah. How difficult do you think that recovery will be when you even tell us that people shunned you, um, people within your circle lost jobs and trans changed jobs because of, of you? Um... Recovery wouldn't be too much of a problem because having lived the same life for the past four years or more, I mean, we just continue with that life mm -hmm. into retirement. Right now, even the little allowance they used to pay me, they've no, not, no, they not been paying you, for the you, past three months. You're going you're gonna to need a job. I still, I, I still, as for jobs, I'll get because... You think it will be easy after this trial? No, no, no. Listen, um, I've got some job to do. I'll get some job to do. Definitely, by the grace of God, I'll get some job to do. Remember, I was telling people my area of speciality is unique. I did a PhD in human rights and politics. We have very limited people who have PhD in human rights. And maybe that's one of the things that helped me defend myself very well. Mm. Because the principles of human rights are the same principles that we hold in law. And therefore, that under underpins our legal system. And therefore, I understood what I was standing in for, and I understood how I was going to defend myself, mm. and also with the support of my lawyers, and I thank them for all the sacrifices they've made, where we have to sleep sometimes at 2 a.m., we have to go to home around 2 a.m., just trying to put things together. Recovery wouldn't be a problem, because definitely I, I, I am a very composed person, um, I speak my mind, I, I, I could be a bit and bold you're ready enough, for it. and I'm ready to go for anything. Let's talk about the independence of the police, something you have mentioned earlier. Um, how bad is the situation with political interference in the police service? Um, Kems, I would rather we reserve this particular topic for another day. And I can assure you that if you decide to give me a whole interview on police reforms and the current situation in Ghana, I will speak to it. But for now, to just make a comment or two mm. on it, I wouldn't, I would rather uh, not comment on the, the current situation. The current situation in particular, I wouldn't. What do you think about the current IGP? The current IGP, I would rather not talk about him. But if you invite me to talk about policing issues and then rope in the IGP's activities, then I'll have a context within which to talk about him so that it will not seem like I'm zeroing in on him. I see. Yes. But, but, but there is a context, isn't there? At the time, you say he was in charge of uh, director of welfare. Yes, because you asked me about my welfare at the time. And he was in charge of welfare. And I expected him to do... And today he's IGP. Today he's IGP. And yes. was, when he became IGP, at least he hasn't shown any interest in my case. Mm -hmm. let, me, let me tell you something. At the point in time, I admired the military because they, they were even allowing a kennel to follow the military kennel to court almost all the time. Almost all the time. Followed him to give him that moral support and other things. Today, that kennel is out. He's been acquitted and discharged. Mm. Did I have that benefit? Nobody cared about me. Nobody thought about it. Even at the time that I was arrested, assuming you are in the house with your children, you've been arrested as a very senior officer. And then you make appeal to the police, look, anybody, because this is a politically inclined whatever, 
anybody could attack my family. Could you help that some patrols who pass there? Nobody even bothered. Nobody minded me at all. So I made up certain appeals that, look, please, my family. Officially? They sent a delegation. I, sent, I, I, I put my case across through the delegation, but nothing was done. And so my family was vulnerable throughout these five years, and particularly when I was in custody. When I'm home, fine. But when I was not home, much of the time, my family was very, very vulnerable. And all of this was because of... Nobody thought about my welfare. And, and maybe because they all thought, ah, the man, we are getting rid of him. Uh, maybe, maybe, maybe he's not coming back. And they managed or to... Or maybe they thought you did it. Well, they may have their own... Um, uh, and I can tell you there were people who thought I did it. Because, and the people, people were really happy. And I knew that they were happy because um, of their personal thoughts about me. Mm. You know, policing, is, uh, policing in Ghana is a very funny thing. And maybe I need to say this. You see, in the current police service, and I'm not talking about the current IGP, whether it was the past IGP or current IGP, sometimes your name denotes which political party you belong to. Your tribe, without even speaking, they have ascribed a political party to you. That is how bad the situation could be. Mm. That people who, who perceive you, you are called Agojo, isn't it? Mm -hmm. You belong to a, partic a, partic a particular political party. It doesn't matter whether you, you do things overtly or co you, your name is enough. But do you? Do you belong to? Throughout my 36 years in the career, have you ever heard anything about me in respect of politics? I told some people some time ago that when I handled the 2016 election, which brought MPP to power. Mm -hmm. Was there any indication? Did I do anything to suggest to anybody that I was NDC or MPP? I did my work together with Mr. Yohonu and the then IGP, Mr. Kudalo. We did our work. That brought them to power. All of a sudden, they have ascribed a political what agenda, uh, whatever, party to me, and people are saying what they want. But they don't have any proof. Those who have decided that they belong to a political party, we know them. They have spoken about it. Have you ever heard me on any conversation or anything that I belong to any political party? No, I've never done that. And I would never do that because I am so professional at my work. And those I teach, those I work with, will tell you, look, this man <laughs> doesn't talk about politics, but I talk about topical issues topical issues, irrespective of who is involved. Mm. And I'll speak my mind on it. And that's it. it ends and, you, there. and you'll continue to do and that. And I'll continue to do that. Thank you for sitting with us. Welcome. I'm privileged to have been on this platform. And thank you so much. We wish you the very best. Thanks. My guest today has been ACP Dr. Benjamin Agojo, who's been through a five-year ordeal trying to clear his name as a prosecution also insisted at the time that he abetted high treason in this country. Today, he's been acquitted and discharged, and he's been sharing his perspective the last five years with us. I hope you enjoyed this episode. I'm Kemeni Amano. I'll see you same time next week. Bye-bye.